Hey, hey, welcome to our weekly coaching call. We've been sharing over just the past few weeks um, some of our experiences from traveling to India and seeing multi-generational growth um, and just some of the ways that God spoke to each of us. There was a crew of us that went, um, Jim Britz, Jim Thurber, Wayne, Matt, Drake, and myself. Did I get everybody? Give me a thumbs up, team. I don't think I left anybody out. And um, and so we've been taking turns just sharing and a little bit about this journey. And this is our final week of this uh, kind of recap series on our trip and some of the takeaways. And we're excited today to talk about uh, a couple things. One is baptisms because we got to see 354 people baptized and we got to baptize them while we were there. And, um, and also comes experiences that went along with that. So I think what we're going to do is I'm going to kick it over to Wayne. He's going to share like three takeaway slides from his time. And then Wayne, when you're done, we're going to bounce it off to Jim Thurber. Is that right? Give me a thumbs up, Jim, if that's you. Good, good, good. So Wayne, take it away. Great. Okay. I'm going to screen share here. Let's see here. Can y'all see that? It's kind of a half photo. So, um, you know, Jim and Brent asked me to kind of summarize what the past three weeks we've done. And so what th I thought I'd do is share a, a quote, you know, a quote from each of the guys. So first, Matt was seeing that, you know, MK's movement was life changing. I'll never be the same. Um, you know, I really learned that we have to grapple with next steps in many areas of leadership. Um, if you can go, you should go. Then Brent said discipleship training is best repeated again and again over weeks and months until the skills and obedience become like second nature. Obedience and accountability. Let's not be in the same place that we are now two years from now. And then I learned that relationships and the church, that Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, are done day to day, face to face in local communities, not weekly. And so the ideal goal is to have churches with local feel, local churches, local leadership. Um, you think about it, we don't disciple our kids at a distance. Um, and we want to model for, for all our disciples that it's about being in community, living life together, no secrets, sharing our junk, being together so you know if if it all costs you know try to meet weekly with other disciple makers and in your in your city in your town in your neighborhood um there's no substitute for that and then um the next area uh let's see drake said you know it was the most impactful time of my life going there if you have a chance to go go to serve, observe, even give financially. It's well worth it. And then Jim Thurber said, I greatly appreciate Jim and Brent on the trip. You know, the main question is what should be our next steps? I'm being directed towards specific next steps for me here in Central Virginia and the Dominican Republic. I'm excited about what God will do. And then Jim Britt had a lot of takeaways. One of the things I heard him say was, the things I saw and experienced were so new, even on this trip, coming back after a year, seeing everything that has happened, multiplying disciples, multiplying leadership. It was so encouraging. And so, you know, one final slide here. You've got India and America. They differ in so many ways, socioeconomically, uh, spiritual temperature. At the same time, there is some overlap in the movements in the two areas. And these are just a couple of thoughts on that. It's just faithful obedience. You know, we just need to be faithful whether we're reaching 116 million people or whether we're meet, reaching out to 16 people. We want to really uh, be faithful because even our kids, if we keep telling our kids to do something and they don't do it after a while we just stop telling them what to do because you know it's not and that can be what the lord does with us so we need to really be faithful with every little lead everything that we do and then 
Next, I call faithful perseverance. And, you know, all the movement leaders, Chris Galanos, everybody says, you've got to be in this for the long haul. You know, MK it took him 15 years to get this thing really going. And then, so are we willing to be farmers, faithful farmers for the next 15 years? You really got to ask yourself that. And then I call it uh, faithful with the plan. You know, the seven sales, we got to really ask ourselves, where are we, you know, you know, needing a little bit more attention. And then one of the things I saw them do there was um, this DBS on Acts. And basically the seven, seven commands of Christ, step by step, they follow these commands and it provides a really nice roadmap to making disciples as well. So once we see groups start, we can kind of see that we can work through these seven commands as well. And so next, I'll turn it over back to the team. Awesome. So I think I'm going to kick it over to Jim. He's going to show a quick um, overview uh, video clip of the baptism time, and then he'll kick it over to Jim Thurber. So Jim, Brett, are you good to go? Okay, here we go. Here is a video. Okay. Yeah. This is just... Um, uh, a little bit of what these guys are going to talk about. Uh, I'm sharing the sound here. Okay, here we go. If we did, it wasn't 354, Brent. It was 384 people we baptized. Here we go. <laughs> So that's how you baptize 384 people in like less than an hour. And you might be going, did people understand even what they were doing? Yes, beforehand, uh, they were explained very, very clearly. And that there'd be some people that didn't speak their language. <laughs> that what the, This is what they'd be saying to us. And so anyways, that was a scene of it. And I think Jim Thurber now is going to take it from here. All right. Thank you, Brent. Great introduction, Wayne. Appreciated that. Yes, uh, like the others, I came away with a lot of insights, and as Wayne pointed out when he quoted me there, some uh, impetus to take some specific next steps with regard to the area that uh, the Lord has laid on my heart here in Virginia to target that's just down the road from us. Thank you, Jim Brits, for showing that video. Uh, that's a great intro because I was asked to speak with regard to the baptisms and primarily, specifically, the reality of demonology. The Lord has given me the opportunity to baptize scores of people over the years. Never was in a situation like this where there were hundreds, as Jim indicated, 384. And to see that line stretched out coming up to the baptismal tank or pool was truly amazing. and. Uh, almost overwhelming because I was struck by the number of people who were not only being baptized, but the number of people who were ministering in that ministry in Bihar and uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, under, MK, uh, uh, under MK's leadership. It, it was almost breathtaking. You saw the baptismal tank there in the, the video. There were five of us in that tank baptizing people. Um, and, and that was a unique experience as well. I happened to be near the stairs, so I was kind of funneling people uh, to the other four men in the tank. And it was a, a delight for me 
to see the delight on the faces of those being baptized, at least, shall I say, the majority of them. Because one of the things that became apparent immediately, and I didn't understand what was going on at first, was the demonic opposition to the baptism. There was a woman who came to the front of the line, and all of a sudden she was struck. And I don't know what the proper terminology might be, but she was struck to the extent that her eyes rolled back. She was just a few feet from me. Her eyes rolled back. She threw her head backward, and her friend standing next to her tried to catch her because she was heading for the ground backward. And she did land on the ground, and I was startled. I, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know quite what to do. In fact, I didn't know what to do. Uh, never been in that situation before, but MK knew what to do, and it was interesting to see him immediately approach that woman. He didn't run to her, but he was not slow in getting to her, and the second thing he did is he motioned for one of his assistants to come, and that man came, and there were two people then converging on this woman, and the first thing they did was pray, and we saw, we experienced the power of prayer. After a few moments, she was able to regain her feet. Uh, she wasn't baptized right away. She went back, uh, I'm assuming, to kind of recover. But eventually she came forward. And I think, uh, Brent, didn't you baptize her? She was the woman in that bright green outfit. And as with so many people, when they got into the tank, and I'd never experienced this before as well, the demonic opposition continued. Now, I don't know whether to label it as resistance or direct demonic uh, opposition, as I said, but there were some people, many people, in fact, who found it difficult to go under the water. And some of us had to put our hands on the person's head and assist them, talk to them, comfort them, praying all the time, and then eventually those people were baptized. As I've said before, I've not experienced that type of demonic activity and resistance. And for me, it underscored the value of baptism. Now, I'll be honest with you, in my years of experience, I knew baptism was important, but I didn't catch the impact, the, the solid impact that ba baptism can have. It's like a watershed experience as we see in Romans chapter six, where symbolizing people being baptized, going under the water, you know, buried with Christ, coming up out of the water, resurrected with Christ. This baptismal experience in that context, in that country, with that type of demonic activity, which MK explained to us a little bit later, it was dramatic, it was overt. It was there, and the people experienced it. We uh, asked MK afterward, is this common? Do you see this type of resistance, this type of demonic activity? And he said, yes, it's common for people to experience this. So for me to be exposed to that, again, it underscored the value of baptism. Baptism allows people anywhere in the world to clearly, openly, publicly identify with Jesus Christ. And for some people, that, that truly is a watershed experience. And it was for many of these, if not all of them. They were coming out of background, backgrounds, as you may have heard or remember Jim Britt sharing uh, on a previous week, coming out of background uh, from situations where little, if any, exposure to Christianity. And under the weight of demonic doctrines and activities, demons freeing people from physical illnesses and setbacks, but as Jim said to us, it's only temporary. Whereas now these people were experiencing complete release, liberation, emancipation from the powers of darkness, just as we see outlined in Ephesians chapter six. So I come back and honestly, folks, I'm praying more shall I say, against the demonic forces that are at work where I am, where you are, or wherever we might go in the, uh, in the world to represent Jesus Christ. 
baptism took on another level of importance for me in seeing the demonic opposition to it in that I, I realized that it is a vital, essential, indispensable initial step of obedience. We're getting people in a context, in a channel, shall I say, of obedience right from the beginning. And we were told by MK, so many of these people, it hasn't, hasn't been long at all, maybe hours or days or, or a week or so, until they're baptized. It's one of the first things that they do to help these people take a strong, firm step toward a clear conscience and under, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, to take a, a stand for Jesus Christ that hopeful will, hopefully will last with them and stay with them for the rest of their lives. So as the other men have said, it was a privilege to be on this trip. And as Wayne said earlier, or, or one of the quotes he, he shared, I think it was from uh, Drake, to join a trip like this, uh, to go into a context, into a situation where a movement is operating and see not only the joy and the delight in these people's faces as they initiate their, their uh, lifelong commitment to Jesus Christ, but also to see how Jesus Christ truly is the victor. Thank you. Drake, it's over to you. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, so uh, as Jim was telling that story, um, he, he failed to mention that uh, MK and his team were like, hey, we're going to baptize 380, plus, you know, somewhere around there, people. But heads up, this is this is like a smaller day. So I really appreciated the... Uh, uh, just the magnitude of, of that space while also be like, oh yeah, this is totally normal. I'm like, yeah, that's just, that's a normal Sunday for us here in Boulder. So that makes sense to me. Um, so man, it, it, it was incredible. It really was. Uh, I just want to share really briefly um, some of the things that I shared with our church when we got back. Um, so similar to what Jim was sharing, and we're all standing there watching, um, watching teams surround at least, at least two women. Uh, one was violently like swinging her arms and trying to punch people um, in the middle of that. And so they, they pray over these ladies, cast out the demons, they get back in line, they get baptized. I mean, it's wild. And you're like, okay, that's a first for me. Um, also heads up, uh, we were baptizing people and kind of in the excitement of it all. Um, I'm pretty sure some water splashed in my mouth. And uh, me and Brent were talking about that. Brent's like rubbing his tongue on his shirt, hoping that uh, he doesn't get sick. And so, I, I'm not saying it's it's the water's fault, but I was sick as a dog the next day, <laughs> and we all ate the same stuff. So I'm blaming it on the baptism water. So heads up, when you're baptizing, don't don't holler too loud. Uh, it was also worth it. But um, in addition to that, it seemed like every single time we stood in a room, whether it was with leaders or with just normal people, and they would stand up and through a translator share their story. Every single person's story was a miraculous encounter with Jesus. Like. I, I don't remember personally, and I, and I could be wrong here. I don't remember one story of like just a simple, yeah, someone shared the good news with me and I trusted in Jesus. Every story we heard was some kind of amazing encounter of the power of God being demonstrated through faithful, ordinary people, through prayer or whatever. So, you know, a lady stands up and, oh, Jesus healed me of, you know, a tumor or a stomach cancer or my kid was sick or I was demon possessed. I mean, over and over again. And at one point, it's like so many stories after seven days of this and you think you kind of get bored like okay cool this is just normal and now you're like just like an axe every time it's like and everyone was amazed and everyone was amazed and you're like that's exactly what's happening i'm amazed every day every story and i i think one of the best ways to say it is while in the west we, we believe in the miraculous like we believe jesus can and wants to and right i mean we try to take that posture it still seems to be the exception not the rule to experience to see the miraculous and i would say that it is the opposite in that context um that they are more surprised when the miraculous is not happening than the other way around and i don't think it's because um jesus is you know more present there if you will than he is here 
The one thing though, I do think that it's different. At least I, I can speak for myself. I can't speak for others. Um, is man, they, they, they just believe Jesus is who he says he is like at a level that, that I think at times I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to give Jesus a cop out, you know, like, Hey, I'll pray for you. You know, and I ask Jesus this or that, but I, I work around it. Whereas, you know, they're just like, yeah, Jesus can do this. He did it for, you know, me, he did it for my brother. He did it for this person. Well, yeah, he can do it for you. I'll share just one, one more story. I was, uh, we were in a small little village, uh, actually the pastor that led in MK, uh, and his brother to Jesus. We were in his, one of his churches, hanging out with him in a small little room before their little church gathered. And there's like, I don't know, 40, 50 people, mostly women on top of this roof, worshiping what's like, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, but we're hanging out before that moment and we're just talking to him, asking him questions. And then he's just sharing stories of like all the crazy stuff that God's doing and asked him how we could pray for him. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, we've seen some people healed and saved and we started a church in these two villages, but now, uh, these people want to kill us. And so um, they told us not to come back. So if you could pray for us that when we go back, they don't kill us. And I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah, we can. My prayers suck. That's what I thought. Like, I, I just, anyway. So he's showing us videos and um, he, he pulls out his phone and there's this video of this lady that he prayed for. I can't remember how we got on the topic. Jim's sitting in the room with me. And um He's shown us this video of this lady who's, who's uh, demon-possessed. We, we must have asked him, hey, does this happen a lot, similar to the day before with that presents? Oh, yeah, all the time. He says, let me show you. He pulls out his phone, and this is lady rolling on the floor. And quite frankly, guys, and, and I'm not a – I mean, I know it's Halloween season, but it's not, you know, it's not really like that. Like, watching it, and this lady is, is making noises that are not human. Right? So, you know, when you read the scriptures and your mind kind of can put all that together, but it's just not real life for you? Well, this video is this lady, like – clearly being possessed and it's clearly not her i mean the voice is not human if that makes sense the best i can explain it and i'm like okay that's pretty creepy right there watching it. and they're just praying for her and she's rolling on the floor making some creepy noises and they do it for a long time in this video and then that's it he just kind of turns the video off and he's like yeah that lady's here today and we cast the demon out and she's in the church and i'm like okay so then we go upstairs and she's standing right there like the lady that i saw in the video who's scaring you know would would, would make a good horror movie She's standing right there. She stands up and shares how Jesus has changed her life and how she's making disciples and starting churches. And you're like, oh my gosh, like this is amazing. And the only other thing, that, and again, same room, miracle, miracle, miracle. So it just, in a similar way to Wayne and Jim, it's just led me to say, man, I just, I don't, I don't know that I, I've given Jesus a chance to answer. You know, James said, you don't have it because you don't ask. And I'm wondering, man. What do I not have because I'm not asking? And so they have a really big confidence in Jesus, just that who he is and what he can do. So they they totally put their, their weight behind him. But what I loved about all of those things is there was still simultaneously a tension in following Jesus. You know, again, there's oppression. Um, they're getting abandoned by family. Uh, there's one lady in the room, the same uh, room that this lady's been set free by from the demon. Uh, her son is there and he's got bone cancer. He's four years old. I got pictures of him. We prayed for him. And so you got all these miraculous stories in the room. And then there's this little boy in the room simultaneously who's got bone cancer who has not been healed. He's got to get blood transfusions every other week. They obviously don't have the money for that. He's very, very sick. And if he doesn't get healed soon, he's probably going to die. Um, and so watching them hold the tension of Jesus 100% being able to answer prayers and do the miraculous for the purpose of his glory and the good of others, while also still holding the tension of praying for this little boy and him not being healed. And that for me stood out a lot, one in a heartbreaking way of like, wow, because how easy would it be to undermine my faith in those spaces? But then they are simultaneously celebrating what God has done and then believing he can do more without it, without it undermining the reality of, of just who Jesus is. So I share all that to say, Jim told me these stories last year, and it might be like you. You're like, wow, that's amazing. To be in a room is such a different experience that I can't. I mean, this is the best I've got. And I would say if you could be in the room, that's where you need to be. It'll change the way that you follow Jesus back home. So, thanks, guys. Wow. Thanks, Drake. So last two 20-second takeaways, and then, Chris, we're done. Um one is I don't I think we will all agree that none of us were as cool as Drake on the trip. And so, so someday we'll be able to be as cool as him. 
Uh, and then the, the uh, second part of that is I remember, I think it was Drake and Jim Britz that were standing behind a blind church planter who um, had his chart up and he had planted nine churches. And, you know, you get to the point on a trip like this where you've seen so many miracles and heard so many testimonies that you kind of have to have moments of humor. So this is a joke. So nobody take this seriously. But because he was blind and I knew he couldn't see me and I was looking right at him and I saw two, at least two of our team members were standing behind him. I locked eyes with our two team members and I was like, so. <laughs> and I just meant it as a joke because at some point you're like, okay, we've got to up our game and our faith and our what we're praying for because God's ready to do something extraordinary through our lives. <laughs> and this is my last takeaway, and then it's back to you, Chris. Um, I have realized through this trip that we have just as many idols as they have in India, in America. And just because they're not gold idols sitting on your shelf that is like an elephant God or this God or this God or this God doesn't mean that we don't have idols. It's anything that takes your time, your energy, your margin away from Jesus. And I just want to encourage everybody as we wrap up the series to recognize that if Jesus is Lord, we have to be willing to get honest about our lives, our calendars, and our schedules, and recognize that we have just as many idol issues in America as they do in India. They just don't look the same. That's it. Yeah, and Chris, could I just add a little bit? I don't want to be anticlimactic, but sure. we ask MK, what's the major difference between the Christians that he works with in India and the Christians that he's experienced here in America, and he gave a one word answer, distractions. Uh, and also Brent, I'm very offended that, that you told me that I sucked. Um, and so I'm, <laughs> I'm still upset about that. Uh, one last uh, a scripture here that we, we shared, talked about a lot in India was from Acts chapter four. It says, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. That's the big takeaway. Passionate about God, uh, with Jesus, uh, relationship with him. And then MK was, is, is from the untouchable class in, in India, and God has given him a big vision and a simple man with a big vision. That just so inspired me. I got to speak to the blind pastor, planter afterwards, and found out he spoke English and he had really good hearing. And he'd asked me, he pointed at Brent, why did Brent think that he sucked? And I had to kind of counsel him a little bit through that. It was a weird situation. <clears throat> hey, let me say this real quick before we go to groups two. Hey, anybody sitting on a question that uh, that they go, I really would love to have asked. We haven't done any Q&A in this. We want to go to groups within four minutes. And if there's no questions, great. But anybody have anything that would you'd love to ask from any of the things we've shared the last couple of weeks or what you've heard about India? I've allowed you guys to unmute. So if anybody wants to unmute and ask directly, that'd be great. I'm just curious, uh, what's different about their prayer life from what you experienced? I'll take that. Um, I was had some extra time with MK when he visited here last week. He was going through, and I said, "How do you pray?" And he says, "I pray until the doors open." And I said, "Well, how long is that?" And he says, "I pray until the doors open." He, there's a sense where the Holy Spirit opens up neighborhoods and areas, and you keep praying and praying and praying and praying and praying and praying until they open, and that was a real challenge to me. I think I they were very sp specific in their prayers to of what they wanted as far as their vision and their goals and very specific. And then they were unified as far as a cor corporately in what they were praying. I'd add loud, passionately, and all at once. What does a church meeting look like?
I'll just say that we all got to go towards the end of the trip and visit um, house churches. So these are just ordinary people. We walked across the muddy fields to get to um, houses with in, no windows, you know, in them. And we crammed in these rooms and we, we did, we did church together. Now in those situations, we didn't ha have interpreters so far as knowing exactly what was being said all the time. We didn't always know exactly, you know, what was going on, but I would say that it's, it's passionate praising and worshiping, giving, following the model of really, that's very similar that we all know, you know, what are you thankful for? Sometimes they're singing that and sometimes they're shouting that sometimes they're dancing that and praising that, but then they move into like, uh, really discovering God's word together. And it's, um, very participatory. Um, what we experienced at least was very much, uh, a form of the, you know, looking back, looking up, looking forward to the future. It was discovery based, uh, home, home church experience. Other, other guys want to say anything about that? I, I thought it was really cool how, uh, a, a large portion of people, um, especially the further out you get in your churches are illiterate. So they're learning theology through songs and, uh, and the teaching is way different from, you know, hey, let's sing two songs, 45 minute teaching, you know, whatever in, in the West. It's, it's, it's like Brent was saying, way more participatory. But um, in addition, they, they would transition very quickly from really passionate singing um, that covered a, a multitude of, of probably theological spaces to really passionate prayer. And like Jim was saying, it wouldn't just be like one guy leading the whole room in prayer. It would be the specific invitation, either in praise or praying for breakthrough or movement. I mean, and so it was a way more of that as a church than maybe the way that we give to teaching in the West. I'll also add there's always a cappella worship and singing. So anyone could break into a song at any time. It was very easy. The most complex they had was tambourines and maybe a drum. So I'm trying to encourage our groups to, to, to do more acapella singing. There's a lot of really good modern songs with acapella. Also, he has a little bit of a teaching time. He said that, you know, someone does 10 minutes of teaching and then they, so they read the passages, slight teaching time, and then they go into discovery. But, um, you know, we, we here have so much, you know, we have so much input from the spirit that I don't know if we need a lot of that teaching, but that's what they do. I'd add two kids were fully involved in what was going on. So it was just a whole family sitting together and their kids are, have way better focus than mine do. And I came away really pleased that everything I saw, um, I concluded it was biblically based. That was a comfort. That was an encouragement. That was instructional. And one other thing that impressed me uh, with regard to the whole ministry that MK is heading up, he is working hard for it to be self-sustaining. I mean, he showed us fish ponds, uh, two in operation, one huge one about to be built. He's talking about having uh, milch cows, you know, dairy farm in order to sustain this ministry, which is humongous now, and hopefully going to get much, much bigger, spreading throughout India and beyond. I was impressed with the biblical basis of it all and the practicality of it all. Russ asked about uh, urban or university settings. We didn't see any university settings, and we didn't see much urban. But we flew into Delhi and we met the the head guy for Delhi, which is a big city. Um, and they just said it's it's very different there um, than it is like in a village. So they're using the same principles, but very he said totally different strategy um, for that. That's about all we can say. I don't think last year when I was there, we actually went to a house church in Delhi, and I would say how the guys are describing it is very similar there. Just was in a in an apartment packed with people. Lewis asked if we're going to go back. Yeah, there'll be, I think, other trips that'll go back as well. We'll keep people updated on that. Uh, 
last question I'll answer it that I see and then we'll be done. Uh, how has your life changed since you've been being back? If anyone wants popcorn style, you can. For me, uh, my prayer life is increased dramatically. Um, just a willingness to recognize it's not something that we do in passing. It's something that we invest our life in and it has a dramatic impact on everything that we do. The Stolies and the Butchers and I had an opportunity to baptize someone because he, he definitely wasn't experiencing any of the gifts of the Spirit and he just needed to be baptized. And so my application was be willing to go there if the Lord leads. Bigger, bigger vision, um, I think expanding my, my vision for multiplication and then also challenged to be stronger leader yeah i agree with matt um and i also came away asking myself and especially asking the lord okay how do i make what i've seen in india applicable here where god has placed me what do i need to retain what do i need to jettison just exactly, Lord, what is the path? And so I really had my ears open when Jim Britz and Brett Hoffman and Wayne and uh, uh, Drake and Matt were speaking as to the impact that it was having on their lives. And that's one of the great things about going on the trip. You get the feedback of the people while they're in process. And it was it was encouraging. It was instructive. It was corrective at times, um, but I came back saying, okay, Lord, kind of what uh, Brent was just saying, what happens now? Where do I go from here in my particular context? I even asked the Lord at my age, do you want me to go back overseas? Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but nothing's impossible with God. Um, but I was so encouraged, like Jim was saying, to make application here. And I'm really interested to see what Jim and Brent and Wayne and the others come up with as far as um, adapting what they saw, especially in the area of training, how we can train people here effectively so that we experience movements across the United States or wherever God might have us. I'd say I was really encouraged and I was discouraged. I was encouraged by what we saw and discouraged of like, oh, that's not what I'm experiencing right now. And honestly, I had to balance those two uh, and, and work through that. But it made me want movement even more that you've actually seen it. And maybe this is the last comment. I wasn't going to share it, but I feel led to do it now. Five years, they saw very little fruit for five years, but they never gave up. So I guess my encouragement to all of us is, are you willing to do, press in, grow, let God move through you, be obedient, and just keep being obedient, even if there wasn't any fruit yet? Because God is faithful and he will give us the breakthrough.